Mark Few doesn't know when he's going to stop coaching at Gonzaga, but he does know who's going to replace it. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Tuesday and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. Go to 5hourenergy.com and use promo code LOCKEDONCFB and you will receive 20% off your order. All right, folks, we got a lot to get to today. We got some mailbag questions to close out the show. We got some scheduling talk to get to some updates. Basically, Mark Few did an interview with John Rothstein of College Hoops Today or on the College Hoops Today podcast, John Rothstein writes at CBS and is a known college basketball insider and general goofball on Twitter. Uh, Marfi talked to him about a handful of different topics, including some scheduling stuff, which we're going to get to in the second segment. Uh, A really nice quote he had about Caliph Battle and what he brings to this team. We'll talk about that as well. But the main thing that came out of this conversation, and it's not It's not really news in the sense that it is something that was kind of widely known already within Gonzaga circles, but has been confirmed publicly by Mark Few in this interview with John Rothstein, which is that Brian Michelson, the current associate head coach for Gonzaga, a coach who has been with the program consistently since 2008 in a variety of different roles. He walked onto the team prior to that. Michelson is the confirmed replacement for Mark Few as the head coach of the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Again, few speaking to John Rothstein. Rothstein asked him a couple of questions in this topic. He asked him how long he plans to continue coaching. He also asked him about kind of a a succession plan following his departure from the program. Uh, This is what Mark Few had to say, direct quote. He said, Brian Michelson will be the guy that takes over for me. That's the great thing about Gonzaga. We always have the next guy up in line. And when asked about how long he plans to coach, Mark Few understandably dodged answering the question specifically. He said, quote, I don't spend a lot of time on that. I don't have a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. For what it's worth, if Mark Few did have a plan in terms of how long he plans to coach, I don't think that he would be revealing it on a podcast randomly in early September. Just doesn't really vibe with who Mark Few is. Uh, It doesn't mean that he's lying or that he actually does have a plan. I have no idea. Maybe he is telling the truth here, but uh, definitely one of those things where you got to ask the question if you're John Rothstein, but you're not expecting an answer there. And I I know that Mark Few was asked about it a little bit in a press conference he did earlier this summer before he headed out to France for the Olympic Games, and he kind of gave a similar answer of not something that's on his radar, not something he's thinking about, not something that he has a plan for, which I think is understandable. And I don't blame him for answering the question that way, whether or not that is the truth or not. But this has always been the plan. Well, let let me rephrase. This has been the plan since Tommy Lloyd's departure. The long-term plan has always been for Gonzaga to replace Mark Few internally. And the plan for decades, or at least over a decade, was for that succession to go to Tommy Lloyd. That Tommy Lloyd would replace Mark Few if and when Mark Few eventually decides being done as the head coach of Gonzaga basketball. Of course, after the 2021 season, Tommy Lloyd decided to leave Gonzaga and take the head coaching job for the Arizona Wildcats, at the time leaving Gonzaga in a spot where it was unclear if they did have a specific succession plan. But at the time, shortly after Tommy left, there was conversation, there was discourse, there was discussion that effectively said, hey, we are planning for Brian Michelson to now be the coach in waiting. Tommy had that title for over a decade. Now Brian Michelson has that title. And and this report by Mark Few, this or this conversation that Mark Few had reported by John Rothstein basically confirms what was already known. That's why I say it's not news in the sense that it's it's an update or a change to the plan. It's just him continuing to reiterate that the plan has not changed for Gonzaga. And there's this is not surprising. And I think it's so unique to Gonzaga. I think a lot of people who are, are fans of other programs 
kind of might struggle to to see this or understand this from a Gonzaga perspective. And, and you see it sometimes when Gonzaga's in realignment conversations of people who say, well, what is that team going to be like without Mark Few? And like, are they, you know, I, I've, I've seen this is not a, a commonly held belief, I don't think, but like, oh, like, if somebody adds Gonzaga, they're just going to be the next DePaul. And DePaul had like a few good years uh, at the mid-major level, got added to the Big East and has been very bad in the Big East for the latter decade or so. Gonzaga and DePaul are nothing like each other in any capacity. So that's just a ridiculous, ludicrous online statement that people have made. But it it's people who struggle to understand that your program is not only as good as your head coach. And, and for a lot of programs, that's true. And you see it at, you know, Isaac and I on Locked On College Basketball just did a, a full episode season preview for Iowa State. And Iowa State, prior to TJ Otzelberger, was very bad. They went two and whatever uh, in the 2020-21 season. And then TJ Otzelberger took over. And immediately that team made the NCAA tournament three straight years. Last year, they won 29 games. Sometimes a coach can immediately come in and turn your program around. Gonzaga hasn't really ever needed that or had that happen. I mean, Mark Few took over in the program, continued the success that they had under Dan Monson in his final year, uh, and he just took it to a, a whole other level for the last 25 years. Uh, and and the, the system is so unique. The, the program is so unique. It's this small school. It's in a small conference. It's in a relatively remote area. And it's, ha- and it's not just like, oh, they're a good mid-major program. There have been coaches who have coached for 25, 30, 40 years at mid-major programs that have had success. Uh, the Bob McKillop was a longtime head coach at Davidson for like 35 years or something, maybe even longer than that. That is tremendous. And Davidson had success. They made the NCAA tournament. Steph Curry, obviously, huge part of that uh, in the uh, early to, or the mid, the late 2000s when they, of course, beat Gonzaga. But it's not like Davidson made the tournament 25 years in a row. It's not like Davidson made the tournament most years uh, under Coach McKillop. Like th- what Gonzaga has done is so unbelievably unique in the college basketball space that it's hard to really think about them handling a coaching change the same way that other programs do, because it's just not, this program is just not the same as other programs. I mean, there's not really any other way to put it. They're just not the same. They're so unique in that way. So I'm not surprised that the plan is to go internal. And I'm not surprised. Again, I don't, this quote does not come from the athletic director or anybody in the uh, in the front office of the uh, at Gonzaga, but I, I think they're probably pretty on board with this. I don't think they want to go do a coaching search and, and kind of do what other mid-major programs or even high major programs have to do, which is, you know, go vet the best candidate and hope that they can come in and, and you know, bring their brand and that it works. That's not going to be what happens at Gonzaga. They're going to keep trying to do things the same way they've done them for the past 25 years, just with a new person as the head coach. And again, it's worth pointing out, we're having this conversation, we're talking about it, we have no idea how long Mark Few is going to go. If the Zags finally do it this year and win the championship, does that mean Mark Few stepping down in March and April of this year? Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Is he going to coach long enough to coach the Team USA in the 2020 Olympic Games in Los Angeles and then hang him up after that? Maybe. Is he going to coach for another 15, 20 years? Is he going to coach into his late 70s? Something we've seen from Rick Pitino and Leonard Hamilton and Jim Laranega and these other coaches. Mike Krzyzewski did it. Tom Izzo's in, at, you know, around that age. Like Maybe he's just going to do this until he literally cannot do it anymore. It makes Gonzaga really unique. And I love that about this program. I love that Brian Michelson being the coach in waiting is just kind of expected, for lack of a better word, and that, yeah, he's not somebody who has head coaching experience. And that that's fine because he's been coaching with Mark Few forever. That is better than anything else that you can get. We see that in the success Tommy Loy has had. I know he hasn't succeeded in the NCAA tournament, but he has had a ton of regular season success. Leon Rice has been very good at Boise State. Again, also struggling in the NCAA tournament, but has been the most successful Boise State basketball coach ever by a tremendous margin. Leon Rice was one of the only coaches that I thought might conceivably replace Mark Few if they didn't want to go the Brian Michelson route because he's been in the system, because he's coached at this level before. But it's a very unique program. And Brian Michelson, having been, I mean, he he walked on the team in 2001. He'd been there since the beginning, from the very beginning. He walked on in 2001, graduated in 2005, came back as an admin assistant in 2008, held that role through 2011, director of basketball ops from 2011 to 2013, replaced Ray Giacoletti on on the staff as an assistant coach in 2013 is reportedly responsible for landing transfers like Kyle Wilcher, Byron Wesley from USC, Nigel Williams-Goss, Jonathan Williams, 
also was charged with landing Zach Collins, the first five-star recruit in program history, as well as Corey Kispert, who was a three-star recruit, was not a very highly regarded prospect, who, of course, developed into an NBA player. Brian Michelson has done some phenomenal things for this program. And whenever Mark Few decides to hang him up, one year, three years, five years, 15 years down the line, as long as Brian Michelson is still that coach in waiting, he is going to be the person who replaces him in Spokane. And that should be, be something that brings peace and comfort to Gonzaga fans, knowing that we already have that lined up right now. Well, Mark Few said a lot more things in this interview with Rothstein. He confirmed that the Baylor game is happening. However, the date and the location still remain a mystery. We're going to talk more about that and some other tidbits from this interview all coming up in just a second. Hey, Locked On fans, I want to take a moment here to give you a heads up on a brand new mobile game that I think you're all going to love, Ultimate College Football Head Coach. In this amazing simulation, you get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your college football program to glory. From recruiting players and hiring a coaching staff to overseeing training camp and handling scholarships, you control every crucial detail of your program. Will you be able to handle the pressure? Ultimate College Football Head Coach is completely free. It has no ads and is 100% playable offline. So you can play on the go whenever you want. And of course, we have a special offer for you Locked On Zags listeners. Use promo code Locked On CFB all caps, inside the game store to receive a free boost to your program. To download the game, just visit ultimate-cfb.com or look it up on the App Store. Ultimate College Football Head Coach, begin your coaching legacy today. All right, folks, segment two, still any patents, still Locked on Zags podcast, and we're still talking about Mark Few's interview with John Rothstein on the College Hoops Today podcast. He talked about the succession plan at Gonzaga, having Brian Michelson be the coach in waiting and said he does not know how long he is going to continue to coach the team. But that is not all that he talked about with John Rothstein. He did confirm to Rothstein that the Zags and Baylor are planning to play each other. We'd already, we've reported on this. In fact, we had Rocco Miller on the podcast last week to discuss the rumors that this game was going to potentially take place in Mexico City, potentially be on Flow Sports as a pay-per-view event. We know the Big 12 really wants to get into the, the Mexico, into Mexico City, have events, have games there. Uh, of course, playing Baylor was kind of a good opportunity for Gonzaga to uh, help the Big 12 out with this endeavor and continue to kind of make themselves more desirable to Brett Yormark and the Big 12 athletic directors and presidents. However, according to a source, and this was said to Theo Lawson of the Spokesman Review, who reported this on social media, the game is unlikely to be in Mexico City. I don't know if there if something specific happened that pulled the idea, if they couldn't make it work logistically, if the TV aspect of it was part of the issue, wh whatever the situation may be currently is, whatever it is, it sounds like it is less likely to happen in Mexico City. Again, Still, until we have confirmation of where it's happening, I don't want to say we can rule it out 100%, but this does put a damper on that potential. Previously, before we had reported that it was uh, that the rumors were, were pointing towards this game happening in Mexico City, the plan had been Las Vegas. So if it's not going to happen in Mexico City, I would assume Las Vegas ends up being the destination here. The date for the game when it was planned in Mexico City was November 6th at this point. We don't know if that's still the date. Mark Few did not confirm a date in his conversation with Rothstein. I would assume that they're still planning to make it work on November 6th or right around that day, sometime in the first week of the college basketball season. Gonzaga does not have a game on the calendar until November 10th when they host Arizona State. The season starts November 4th, so there's a lot of time in that schedule. I believe Baylor's first game right now is scheduled for November 8th. So the odds of this game happening the 4th, 5th, or 6th feel very, very high. It's not going to happen the 7th because Baylor's not going to play back-to-back -back days. Uh, and the 4th is the first day that it can happen. So 4th, 5th, 6th feels like the light, like, likely outcome here. Again, no, the game may not take place in Mexico City, but I don't see why it wouldn't happen on November 6th unless there is an issue in terms of finding a venue and they can't find a venue unless they do it on the 5th or the 4th or something like that. So expect to see this game in the first three days of the college basketball season. I would expect it to be in Las Vegas, but that is just speculation on my part based on what the previous reporting was, uh, not any inside information in that regard. Now, at this point, with the Baylor game confirmed, even if we do not know the date, 
We now have 30 out of 31 games for Gonzaga officially on the calendar. We are still waiting on one more game. I'm going to breeze through what the schedule looks like at this point and then give you a projection for that last game, talk a little bit about Caleb Battle, and then we'll move on to the mailbag portion of the show. So we got the first game is going to be that Baylor game, most likely, or at least we're expecting that to be the first game. Uh, November 10th against Arizona State, we mentioned that. Then eight days later, Gonzaga will play San Diego State at the VA House Arena in San Diego, part of that home-and-home home series. That is on November 18th. Two days later, Gonzaga will host Long Beach State at the Kennel on November 20th. Then they will have their battle for Atlantis November 27th through the 29th. Uh, they will open that up against West Virginia and then play the winner of Indiana, or excuse me, they'll play uh, either Indiana or Louisville, depending on whether they win and who wins that game. And then they'll play their, their third game will be hopefully against Arizona. The other options there would be Providence, Oklahoma, or Davidson. Those games will, of course, take place in the Bahamas. They return from their trip to the Bahamas. They'll play Kentucky at the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle on December 7th, a week later. And I think that week is finals week, although I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but a week after that, they will play UConn on December 14th at the Madison Square Garden. That is an epic, epic college basketball game that's going to take place there. Four days later, the Zags host Nichols State in the Kennel. Three days after that, they host Bucknell in the Kennel on December 21st. Then they have a week off for the holidays before they play UCLA at the Intuit Dome in Los Angeles, the new home of the LA Clippers. That game on December 28th. Two days later, they start conference play. So we got one game remaining on this schedule, and that's, again, that's including Baylor. So one game left. It's going to be a by game situation. It's not going to be another marquee game. I'd be very surprised if that were the case. I'm thinking we're, we're going to see another SWAC team, a, a, a Mississippi Valley State, Jackson State type of opponent, Alcorn State, whomever, or maybe it'll be a local team that hasn't finalized their schedule yet, a, an Idaho State, Montana type team, or, and, and honestly, this is the guess that I'm going to go with. This is going to be my stamp this as my prediction. I don't want to say bold because it's really not bold at all, but my prediction for Gonzaga's final game on the calendar, and it's it's not going to be a game that makes a lot of you super thrilled, but it is my prediction. It's going to be Eastern Oregon. They've played Eastern Oregon the last two years. Eastern Oregon is an NAIA opponent, non-Division One, not even D2 or D3, all the way down at the NAIA level. And I think this game is going to take place, uh, whether, it's, whether it's Eastern Oregon or not, I think this game is going to take place between November 10th and November 18th. 18th. Uh, that is an eight-day gap right now, and you typically see teams play four or five games before they go to their MTE around Thanksgiving. Gonzaga does have four games already scheduled, but looking at the, the calendar again, that's why I mentioned the finals week. If finals week is that week between the December 7th and December 14th, I don't think you'll see a game there. If that's not when finals week is, maybe this last game ends up in that stretch, but I think it's more likely going to be between November 10th and November 18th, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's an Eastern Oregon or a non D1 opponent, or if it is a D1 team, it'll be somebody who finished probably outside the top 300 in Ken Palm last year as the Zags look to add a bye game to the calendar. Last note here, I want to read a quote that was from the interview that was tweeted by Theo Lawson about Caliph Battle by Mark Few that I thought kind of is a good reminder of what he brings to this team. Here's the direct quote from Mark Few. He says, quote, he's what we haven't had. We haven't had kind of that live wire, quick twitch wing player that can just get his own shot anytime he wants, can get downhill on people, can get himself to the free throw line. And I would agree. I think this has been an area that the Zags traditionally haven't had a lot of success recruiting and adding in the transfer portal and just haven't really had on the roster. A lot of the kind of threes that they've had in the past, the successful ones, have been very good outside shooters. Your Corey Kispert, your Julian Strothers, obviously you go back to your Adam Morrisons, players of, of that ilk. Whereas the majority of players they've had who are those downhill scorers, those get your own bucket types, have traditionally been guards. Jalen Suggs is perhaps the most notable example of that. Uh, obviously, a lot of Gonzaga's offense historically has come from the front court as well. Uh, and this is just not a, a player archetype that has traditionally been in Gonzaga's system over the over Mark Few's tenure over the last 25 years. And I, whenever I get an opportunity to bring up this stat, I want to bring it up because it's really really demonstrates how unique Caliph Battle is and how unique his skill set is on this roster. Last year, Caliph Battle made 186 free throws. 
That was on 213 attempts, about 87%. So not only is he a very effective free throw shooter, he made 186 of them. Here's the key. Graham E.K. led Gonzaga in free throw makes and attempts last year. Graham E.K. attempted 134 free throws. So Caleb Battle made 52 more free throws than Graham E.K. attempted last year. Battle made 81 more free throws than E.K. made. And again, E.K. led the team with 105 makes from the free throw line last year. Battle made 81 more than that. He was a remarkable, remarkable athlete who is elite at getting to the free throw line and converting from the charity stripe. He is such an impactful player for the Gonzaga game. I would, I would bet that Gonzaga basketball games on average are going to take longer next year just because of how much time Caliph Battle is going to spend at the free throw line. That is not a bad thing. That is not a criticism. That is a fact. Caleb Battle is such a dynamic scorer and does so much of his damage at the free throw line that I think Gonzaga basketball games are going to legitimately take longer next year because of how much time he's going to spend at the charity strike. Folks, we're closing out the show with a trio of mailbag questions that we did not get to as we did not do a show for Monday here in the offseason for Locked On Zags. Does Gonzaga have an under-the-radar player who might surprise folks this season? We're going to talk about that and more coming up in just a second. But first, folks, let's talk about five-hour energy because just about every single day, right after lunch, I feel tired. It's that little afternoon lull that we all hit. And if you're like me, you're not alone. In fact, research shows that 70% of us hit a wall after lunch. So let a five-hour energy shot help you leap over that wall instead of crashing into it. I've been working on cutting out my sugar as I get older, so I love that five-hour energy has zero sugar. Plus, it's got a convenient portable size and is the perfect pick-me-up for getting stuff done. The 5-Hour Energy website has flavors galore, watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and more. You can try them all on the site, and you even have the option to build your own 12 or 24-pack. You choose the flavors, and it's delivered right to your door. So just go to 5HourEnergy.com and get some 5-Hour Energy product today. You can use my promo code LOCKEDONCFB to receive 20% off your order. Offers only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions, and the code is no good on subscription orders. So go to 5hourenergy.com today. All right, folks, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags. And I know it's Tuesday and it's segment three, but we are finally getting to our mailbag Monday portion of the show this week. We had a trio of questions from Jeff via Gmail, sent in these questions over the weekend, getting to them here today. Uh, great stuff here from Jeff. This first question, he says, during the 2023 transfer portal window, Kansas and UConn battled to get Nick Timberlake, who ultimately went to Kansas. UConn then picked up the next best option in Cam Spencer. As it turns out, Timberlake proved pretty ineffective most of last year, while Spencer exploded and played a major role in helping UConn to the national title. Is there an under-the-radar type player on Gonzaga's team that could do something similar to what Spencer did for UConn? Yeah, that's a tough question um, if for a couple of reasons. One, I think Cam, there, there's not just a lot of Cam Spencers. That was an incredibly unique situation. Spencer was tailor-made for Danny Hurley's offense. Cam Spencer is basically just like a mini version of Danny Hurley. I say mini, I'm pretty sure he's probably five inches taller than him, but super intense guy, just really, they're very similar. And it was a really, really good fit. I'm surprised that he was not their top option, but it clearly worked out very well for them. The other reason it's a hard question to answer is because as somebody who follows Gonzaga basketball literally every single day, I don't really know who is under the radar on this team. Uh, we kind of know the lineup. We know this, the rotation. We kind of know how things are generally going to play out. At least we have a good guess as to that. In terms of players who transferred to Gonzaga this offseason, I don't really think Mike Lajayi, who was in the draft conversation all offseason, or Caleb Battle, who averaged 29.5 points per game in the final seven games of the season, playing for an SEC team in Arkansas, I don't really think either of those guys are under the radar. I don't really think they can qualify in the same way. I know I know Cam Spencer came from a power program in Rutgers, but it was Rutgers. It's not the same as Arkansas. Uh, and, and he wasn't an NBA prospect the way that Michael Ajayi was. So uh, I don't really think either of those guys qualify. Emmanuel Innocente would qualify more in terms of being under the radar, but I don't think he's going to play enough this year to make that kind of impact. Uh, 
Jeff mentioned in the question, I didn't, I didn't read the whole question, but he mentioned Steel Venters would have been his pick, except he got hurt. And I agree. I think Steel Venters actually fits this category extremely well uh, as kind of that Cam Spencer player you're not expecting to make a huge impact for the team type of thing. But obviously, Steel Venters is not going to play this upcoming season. Uh, Jeff also mentioned Ben Gregg, and I think he's probably the best choice. He's obviously not a, a transfer into the program, but somebody who I don't think is super well-known nationally. Again, he didn't start for Gonzaga until the second half of last season, but he's a player who I think if Gonzaga is going to win a national championship this year, a lot of things have to go right. But one of the big things is Ben Gregg having a really big final season. Like whether he's starting or coming off the bench, he's going to be a guy who needs to average 13, 14, 15 points a game, shoot 40 plus percent from three, be the best post defensive player on the team. Like if he's all those things, then I think he qualifies in this category. And I think he also has a huge role on helping this team become a national championship contender. Outside of that, I mean, Dusty Strummer was a pretty highly regarded prospect. Braden Huff maybe qualifies in this category as well. He's not going to start uh, the way that Cam Spencer came in and immediately started for UConn, but I think he's going to make a big di a big impact on this team. I, I think the best answer for this question is Ben Gregg, but I think the 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 true answer is that there's, there's not really a Cam Spencer type player, certainly not an addition, uh, who's as under the radar, who's going to impact the team this way. Cam Spencer was very unique for what he was able to bring to UConn last year. Next question from Jeff. He says, I've been listening to your podcast pretty regularly since 2021, and I've been curious to ask. Seems you've been doing these types of podcasts for about 10 years or so now. How did you get started? And what do you like the most about these podcasts? Or what is it that keeps you going day after day, month after month, all these years? Well, I appreciate the question, certainly I appreciate the long time listening. That is very much uh, how I'm able to continue to do this. Uh, it has not been 10 years. It has been about five years that I've been podcasting at all. Still very clearly remember the first episode of any podcast that I did, which was actually Locked on Mariners, which I did for about six weeks back in 2019. Uh, if you'd listen to that podcast, you certainly would not think that I'd been doing it for 10 years because I was very, very rough uh, the first time I did it, but I have uh, since, I think, gotten a little bit better at it. Uh, in terms of why I like doing it, it's because it's different every day. I'm not somebody who succeeds in monotony, in having your day-to-day -day seem very similar. It's just, it's it doesn't work for me. I've tried it, and it has not worked for me. And while certainly aspects of this are the same day to day to the point where as soon as I shut my blinds, my dog, which nor who normally sits on this chair right here, she gets up and walks out of the room because she knows that means that I'm about to record. Like there are things that, that are the same every single day, editing the show, things like that. But the content is different. I get to flex my creative muscles, which is something that uh, has always appealed to me professionally, getting that chance to, to come up with ideas for content, to uh, you know reach out to guests and try to track down people to come onto the show and make it better and, and really just be able to serve Gonzaga fans. I am a huge Gonzaga basketball fan. I'm a huge Gonzaga sports fan. And being able to help make other people's fandom for Gonzaga better is something that means a lot to me. So continuing to be able to do that is 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 what what makes me want to keep doing this and seeing the success that the show has had is is a huge part of that as well. And I'll save some of that for this final question here. Also from Jeff again, he says it seems that the Lockdown Network has been going for the better part of four years. And if the Big East is included as a power conference, then Gonzaga is the only program from a non-power conference that has a locked on show. How is Gonzaga able to keep qualifying and maintaining a locked on channel, especially since there are several programs from power conferences that do not have them? Eh, I mean, without trying to toot my own horn, the answer to that question is that the show is successful. Uh, it's not just because of me, it's because of you. Not just you, Jeff, but everybody else who listens to the show regularly, whether this is your first, 10th, 100th, 350th time listening to the show, that's what makes it successful. The only non-Power 4 team that has a show on the network is UConn. Um, they only started a show this calendar year in 2024 after a lot of nagging from folks uh, to, to convince them that this is a show that, that matters, that should happen. In fact, I actually pitched Locked On Big East as a show two years ago. And the response from leadership was, well, what about just doing Locked On College Basketball, which is what, of course, ultimately ended up happening. Myself, my co-host, Isaac Shade, uh, have been doing Locked On College Basketball for the last two years. Um, 
the Gonzaga show started initially because the parent company that owns Locked On Tecna uh, also owns a handful of news stations across the country, uh, including KREM, which is located in Spokane. They wanted to have a show in Spokane that could kind of work with the news station there. That's why they started Locked On Zags. I was not the first host for Locked On Zags. That was the great Stephen Carr, who now works at Gonzaga. I replaced him in 2021. The show has been very successful since then. And, and something that I'm incredibly proud of and will forever be proud of is the fact that every single college fo- college show on the network outside of mine has football. Yes, including UConn. They do. They do have a football team. I'm the only one that doesn't have football. And college football is king in terms of content creation, in terms of uh, like there's more people who care about college football than college basketball. And while people like to remind me of that, my show is... Locked on Zags is continually in the middle of the pack among college shows, if not higher. We're we're never towards the bottom. Even now in September, when college football is the the king right now, this show still does well. And I I will take some credit for that, certainly. But like I said, it is also because of all of you who listen to the show, who who are subscribed, who are on the Discord channel. Anybody who has who has made this show part of your daily routine, it is tremendously appreciated. It is why. I get to continue to do what I do on this show. I try to do everything that I can to make you want to keep listening to this podcast. And so far, that has worked. And I hope to continue to do this for a very, very long time because it is my favorite job that I have ever had. And I hope to continue it. And I'm eternally grateful to all of you, as well as to Locked On and the leadership there for letting me continue to do this because it has been an absolute blast. We're about eight weeks out from the start of the college basketball season. We still got... Lots of fun stuff to get to this this offseason. We're going to start our player preview series in a couple of weeks. Uh, we got some bold predictions coming your way later this week. Of course, we got some recruiting stuff to get to for two days from now. As many of you are listening to this, Isaiah Harwell will commit. Uh, we'll find we'll talk about that, whether he comes to Gonzaga, whether he goes to Houston, somewhere else. We'll talk about what that means for the Zags as well. All that coming up later this week and this month. But for now, that is going to wrap it up for me today. Thank you again so much for listening to the show. And until next time. As always, go Zags.